Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for coming and joining our Sunday worship program. So let's pray together. <coughs> our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for gathering us today. It is by your grace and by your love that we are here praising you and glorifying you. And we want to listen to your word more and more so that we can find out your will in our life. So Lord, when we are listening to your word, open our heart and give us understanding so that we can understand your will and your plan from the scripture more clearly. From the beginning to the end, I commit the rest of this time unto your mighty hand. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's open the Bible, Acts chapter 17, uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. Acts, after John, there's Acts, Acts chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. So if you have found it, let us read. Uh, verse 16 and 17 together. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked with him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Today I'd like to talk about who is true God. Who is true God? And here, one day, Apostle Paul was preaching in Athens. Do you know Athens? It's in Greece, actually. Athens was the, um, the central place of Greece. Of course, in the time of Apostle Paul, now the Roman Empire was dominant, but still Athens was the center of culture and center of actually idol worshiping, right? So one day, Apostle Paul went to Athens and found out they are worshiping so many gods. So he saw the sculpture, the images of idols here and there. That's why in verse 16, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him. His spirit was provoked means he felt very bad actually. Why? Why these people worship so many idols, right? So his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. What are idols? Idols are false gods, gods people invented. Actually. So let me give you what is happening. There's one true God who gave us the Bible, who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So we have this true God who is creator of everything, including us. But because of the sin of Adam and Eve, people became ignorant. People became so sinful and their spirit is dead. Our spirit is dead when we were born. And what happened was we don't recognize the true God. And that's why people started worshiping idols, the false God. So, let's think about this. God is up there, but people do not know the true God. So they came up with all kinds of ideas of this kind of God, that kind of God. For example, when they see the storm in the sea, they want to pray to someone, right? And they are, some of the uh, people in, uh, who are at sea, they, are, they have invented, they imagine there's some God inside the sea, so sometimes, for example, uh, in the book of Jonah, in the Bible, uh, when there's a storm, they decided to sacrifice a human, like a, you know, killing a man and then throwing a human into the sea to satisfy the God. Why? Because they want to do something, right? 
So they are all idols. So the difference between the true God and idol is the true God is the one who created the whole universe. But these idols are the invention of people. So let's go to verse 22. Verse 22 to 25. Let me read. Uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 22 to 25. Let me read. Then Paul stood in the midst of the uh, Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through the and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Verse 24, 25, let's read it together. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and the and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. The Bible is very precious because the Bible tells us the truth about God. Right? That's why we are studying the Bible. Here, Apostle Paul, he started preaching to the people in Athens and Apostle Paul was very wise. So he pointed out one idol, right? There's one statue of God but the inscription, the inscription, what they wrote was very interesting. What was that? To the, to the unknown God, unknown God. What happened was, uh, this is the idea of the people of Greece. They thought, they believed there are many gods, right? Like uh, Zeus or Venus, you know, these Greek gods are many. And then, they were thinking, oh, maybe, maybe there's a God we do not know. And if we do not worship that unknown God, that God will be angry. Okay? He will get mad. So they made one idol. And then on that altar, they put the inscription saying to the, to the unknown God. Unknown God, please don't get mad at us. You know, we don't know your name, but we still want to worship you. So please bless us. That was their idea. So what do you think? They are smart or not? Actually, they are very blind, actually, right? Let me tell you, in Korea, people used to worship their ancestors. You know, ancestors, like um, if your father or grandfather or grandmother uh, pass away, uh, then, when they are dead, of course you are, you are missing them. But Korean when father, not just miss them, they wanted to, we decided to worship them, right? So even now people do that. So what they do was, they remember the day they passed away, and then on the day, on the night, they prepare some uh, food, right? There's a way, there's a very specific way of preparing food. Uh, which direction, which food, which direction, which food. And then they are, you know, uh, bowing before the photograph of the ancestors and then try to worship ancestors. And the general idea is, if we do not worship these uh, dead ancestors, uh, something bad will happen. Something bad, right? Of course we know that's not true. Only through the Bible we know the truth. The Bible says, after people die, people go to heaven or hell. The spirit does not roam around. The spirit cannot come to our house, right? So it's not actually, it's not actually those ancestors who are coming. It is the, the evil spirit coming and taking all the worship. That's why these uh, worshiping ancestors is actually worshiping the evil spirit. And then um, you think about this one. Suppose. We can think about whether this is true or not. This ancestor worshiping is true or not. If you go to America or Europe, 
Do people worship their dead ancestors or not? Have you seen any uh, Americans or European setting the table for the dead father or grandfather and worshiping them? They never do that, right? And then the point is, okay, which country lives better, Korea or America? Of course, Americans are richer, right? So the question is, they do not even you know, serve their dead ancestors, then why they are more blessed, right? If, if the ancestors really come and take the worship and bless us, we should be more blessed because we are serving our ancestors who are dead, but the Americans, they don't know. Uh, they don't do that, right? Or Europeans. So if you think a little bit, if you think a little bit about this sort of practice or either worshiping, you know, it's not true actually. So all the idols are invention, you know, invention. They are not true, but people invented them. People imagined them because they want to have some kind of comfort in their heart. Uh, that's why they are worshiping. So here uh, in verse 23, for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Apostle Paul was very wise. He said, people, you are worshiping unknown God, but I will let you know the true God. I think that the Apostle Paul, uh, the Holy Spirit helped him so that he can bring up this very important issue, starting from that idol with that inscription to the unknown God, right? And then in verse 24, he said, so uh, when we study the Bible, we learn many things about the true God. So verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. First, if there's a truly God, he does not dwell in the buildings, human a built actually. Do you know how small this earth is compared to all the galaxies and everything in the universe, right? How many stars are there in our galaxy? Some people say 100 billion or some people say even 200 billion. So many actually. Billions and billion stars are here in our galaxy only. And let me ask you, this earth we are living on, is, it, is this a star or not? No, it's a planet. What's the difference between planet and star? Star can shine by itself, right? Earth, maybe we might reflect the light from the sun, but we do not shine by itself. So it's a planet. It's not even star, right? But there are more than 100 billion stars in our galaxy only. And then how many galaxies are there in the universe? Again, 100 billion galaxies. So if there's really God who created all the stars in the universe, how can, how can we expect him to be in the building made with the hands of people, right? But we, you know, people, think in their own view only, right? Uh, people build some house, temples, and thinking that God is dwelling in the temple. Of course, now we are in the church building. You know, we believe God is everywhere. Then why we are gathering here? To, to be here to worship Him, right? And to have fellowship with each other. But, you know, God is everywhere, actually, right? So, when we study the Bible, we come to know the truth about God more and more. Suppose God is only in, the, in this building, church building, then what will happen is when you come to the church, you become holy and godly. And then when you go out of the church, you think there's no God. Okay, I can do whatever I want, right? That's not true. No, God is everywhere. Of course, I, I believe God's attention is here in the church building. Like a God cares more about the church because we are God's children. But it doesn't mean God is only in this building, right? So we learned that, we learned that God does not dwell in the 
temples. And verse 25, this is important. Nor is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. Let's think about this. People have this idea of, oh, we have to give something to God, right? We have to give, we have to give money, and we have to give something, uh, some, uh, if there's a harvest, the best harvest we have to give God, we have to give to God this and that to please Him. And let's think about this one. Does God need anything from our hands? No. He doesn't need anything from our hands because God owns everything, right? Like, a, you know, diamond, gold, very precious, very expensive. God owns them all, actually, right? People think they own them, but it is all from God. So, God doesn't need anything. On the other hand, from the Bible we know, He gives to all. He gives to everyone life, breath, and all things. Life, breath, and all things. It's true. God is a giver. God gives us everything we need again and again and again, right? For example, we are breathing now, right? This breath is from God. In Genesis chapter 1, after God made a man out of dust, He put the, the breath, right? And then Adam became a living being, right? So even our life, our breath is from God. Actually, without Him, without Him, we cannot even live one second. A moment we'll all die because God is giving us everything we need that's how we can live even single moment right that's why we thank God that's why we are here to worship him to please him to obey him because he is the creator God right do you know how big God is let's turn to Isaiah Isaiah chapter 40 Isaiah chapter 40 verse 15 Isaiah chapter 40 verse 15 let's read it together behold the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales Look, he lifts up the eyes as a very little thing. You see here? Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. You know, we have a bucket of water, right? Water in a bucket. Then the nation, like a Korea, or we have Indian here, India, America, they are like a drop, one drop of water in a bucket. What does that mean? God is so huge, gigantic, Compared to him, even the nations, strong nations, powerful nations, they are like a drop in a bucket and then and are counted as a small dust on the scale. We are like a dust. Dust. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 66, the last chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1 and 2. Let's read it together. Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made, and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Heaven is my throne. You know throne? Throne is a chair, chair for king. So king is sitting on a throne, right? So this heaven is God's throne, and this earth is his footstool. We don't use footstool these days, but footstool is where you place your foot, your feet, to rest, actually, right? The small thing, right? When you sit on the chair, uh, if you have a footstool, I have one in my office, uh, sometimes to take a rest, right? So it's a small thing, you put your feet 
when you take a rest. So this earth is what? God's footstool. And you know how big God is, right? Only through the Bible we come to know, oh, God is everywhere. God is, we call it omnipresent. Omnipresent means God is everywhere. And God is omnipotent. Omnipotent is all powerful, right? And He is the true creator. All other idols are false gods, people's invention. There's difference, actually. There's difference, right? And let's go back to uh, Acts chapter 17. 26, verse 26 to 29. So this is the, the sermon of Apostle Paul in Athens regarding this unknown God, right? So verse 26, Acts chapter 17, um, verse 26 to 29. Let's read it together. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like a gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Yes. In verse 26, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Do you know that when we look at the blood, we know that there was a one couple in the beginning, only one man and one woman, because how many blood types are there? Four. A, B, A, B, O, right? And these four blood types are the one, these four can come from one couple, actually. If a husband is type A and a wife is type B, we can have these four. Suppose there are eight blood types, then can you believe the Bible? No, it's not possible actually. From one couple, maximum number is four actually. Okay? There cannot be eight or ten blood types, right? So from this also we know, okay, we, when you go back, 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 there's an original couple, one couple, the first couple, who, is, who are Adam and Eve, right? So God made from one blood every nation of men. That's what happened. And then God set the boundaries of their dwelling. God set the boundaries means God gave this earth for us to live. You know, these days people will say, okay, we can go to the Mars, and they try to build some space shuttle, and even they are, uh, some people are really planning on them, right? So they have a project of uh, sending humans to other planets because they think this earth is overcrowded, okay? Do you think uh, it'll, they will succeed? No, actually. Uh, one time, I remember, there was a one space shuttle named the Challenger. Do you remember Challenger in America? What happened to Challenger? I'm very sorry to say that, but the Challenger exploded right after uh, it, 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 it launched. It was launched, right? And I think they named it wrong, Challenger. They challenged it whom? God. You know, how can they name the space shuttle Challenger and then launch it into the space, right? It, it just means that, God, we want to challenge you, right? The Challenger, you know, it is gone because of the name, I guess. But here, um, verse 28, for in Him we live and move and have our being. Yes, in Him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Um, do you know why God loves us? Because we are His offspring. Offspring means 
we are his creature. God created us in his own image. What does that mean? Image. Does that mean God looks like us? No. God is spirit, right? Image means we have all the characters and attributes of God in us. For example, we are intelligent. That means God is also intelligent. You know, we have emotion. Then God has also emotion. Do you remember Jesus wept? When you read the Bible, right? Jesus wept. Wept means he cried sometimes because he had an emotion, right? And we can create something. And God is the creator also, right? So we are like a small God. We are his offsprings. And because we are his offsprings, that's why God loves us up to the point that he gave his own son to die for us, right? And uh, verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, yes, that God who created the whole universe loves us, right? And that's why we ought, verse 29, we ought not to think that divine nature is like a gold or silver or stone. Do not think God, you know, we can make God's image with gold or stone or silver because God is too big to be, to be made with our hands, actually. That's why in the Bible, God commanded not to make any image in according, uh, you know, in, in God's, do not make any God's image. Do not even imagine what God looks like. Let's turn to ex, ex, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Uh, Exodus Chapter 20, verse 4. Verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5. Let's read it together. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. Do not make a carved image for God. Why? Because that makes God so small, right? So small. You know, God is not like a human. God is not, not like an animal. God is not like anything in this world. He's too big, too powerful, right? We, how can he make the image of God? So once you make some image of God, no matter how big it is. For example, you know, sometimes people make... I, when I went to Hong Kong, there's a mountain, and there is a, such a great statue of Buddha on the back side of Hong Kong. I, I saw that and I said, wow, how could they make such a big Buddha, right? But still, no matter how big it is, compared to the whole universe, right? It's nothing. It's nothing. So once people make the image of God, they think God is that small, actually. That's why God said, you shall not make any carved image. God is beyond our imagination. We cannot even think about how big God is, how powerful God is. You know, how can God be, uh, you know, be any carved image? Gold or silver, we think gold or silver are very precious, but before God, it's not so precious, actually. So the moment we try to make God in any image, we are making him smaller than who he is, right? That's why we shouldn't make any image, carved image. Sometimes even Christians, we think God is so small, right? That's why you, we are worried sometimes. Let me ask you, do you worry sometimes? That means you, you, you are making God so small, actually, right? If you truly believe 
So God who created the heavens and the earth, He is our Father. Why you should worry? Why you should worry? Okay, let me ask you again. Do you think God can do anything? Yeah. Yes. Then why you worry? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> yes. Number one, if you, if you believe God has nothing uh, impossible to do, and number two, if you believe God loves you, then there's nothing to worry about, actually. That's why we have to study the Bible more and more. The moment you make a carved image, then God becomes this small, okay? And that is not true God. That's why God said, you shall not make any carved image, right? So how can we know, how can you know the true God? That's why we have the Bible. We know when we look at the nature, we can see God's power and His intelligence. Listen to Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Let's read it together. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The, the one way to know God exists is through the nature, through the plant, through the animals, through the universe, the God's creature. They are so amazing actually, right? Look at your body. How many cells do you have? Some people say 60 trillion or up to 100 trillion. Maybe I'm, I have 100 trillion because I'm a little bit big, right? <laughs> no, some who are short, they have 60 trillion. It's amazing this, so many cells working together. And haven't you thought this way? For example, like eyebrow, they don't grow, hair grow. They are not that far from each other, right? But why eyebrow do not grow, but hairs growing, growing? So I was imagining uh, if my eyebrow is also growing, it will come like this, right? <laughs> blocking my eyes. Yeah. When we take out the food, food, right? Uh, it goes through the mouth and then it goes through the stomach and all these uh, intestines, small intestine and all these things. And we take all the energy and nutrition from the food, which is amazing, actually. Huh? How can this uh, stomach knows how to take all this nutrition from the food we take? Um, sometimes, you know, I drink a coffee and then I'm thinking, oh, this coffee is black, but how can this black color is disappearing in my body, right? It's absorbed some way, somehow, right? So anyway, um, even this nail, fingernails are growing to protect me, right? How they grow, and then, um, you know, it's a protection for us. And when we get some virus, then the body knows how to fight. And remember, we all began from one cell. One cell. And small cell which we cannot even see, but the cell has all the information of how to fight the virus, how to grow, right? How to digest food, how to protect our body from one cell. So, from the nature, we know that God is there. But also that's why the second way actually even if we know God exists from the nature, we do not know what God is like. The character we do not know. That's why God gave us the Bible, to know uh, the God we believe, what kind of person He is, what kind of character He has, right? So the nature and the Bible, they are the ways to see God. And let's remember, God is not far from us, actually. In Acts chapter 17, we read verse 27, verse 27, 
so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though let's read the rest of it together he is not far from each one of us he is not far from us each one of us he's near he's right here actually right he is knocking on our heart he wants to have a fellowship with us that's why you know, God gave us the Bible and what, why, the reason why God created us is to have fellowship with us, to be with us. And let's remember one more thing. Idols. There are so many idols in this world. You know that in Japan, they worship 8 million gods, right? And when I was in India, they have uh, how many? How many? 330 million. Uh, they call it... Uh, 33 crore actually yes so many idols are there for those idols this is what the scripture says listen to Isaiah chapter 41 Isaiah chapter 41 verse 21 to 24 verse 21 to 24 let's read it together Present to your case, says the Lord. Bring forth your strong regions, says the King of Jacob. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare to us things to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God's. Yes, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and see it together. Indeed, you are nothing, and your work is nothing. He who chooses you is an abomination. One time I just said, there's one tree, one tree. So people cut the tree, and then half of the tree, they uh, use it as a firewood, you know, firewood to bake some food, uh, bread, or something like that, right? And then half of it, they carve the image of idol and they worship the idol. And I just said, how foolish you are with the same tree, with the same tree, half of it, you just burn them as a firewood, but the other half, you know, you make it as an idol and worship. You know, true God is not like that. They are just either. So here, present your case, says the Lord. Present your case. Bring forth your string region, says the king of Jacob. Here, God is challenging all these idols, saying that if idols, if you are true God, present your case. Show the evidence. I was born again in 1989. Even though I was born in Catholic family, no, my whole family was Catholics before. My grandfather was Catholic, my father was Catholic, I was Catholic. But when I was in Catholic church, I didn't really believe the Bible. No. I thought the Bible is very interesting because there are very many interesting stories, right? I thought they are just stories, stories. People make up stories, right? Because uh, you know, we want to, we enjoy interesting stories. So I thought all this Noah's Ark, Adam and Eve, the Tower of Babel, all these things are interesting stories. Until I attended um, the Bible seminar in 1989, and I, I saw the evidences, actually, evidences. I still remember when the pastor, at that time, no computer. Okay, in 1989, they, they used the OHP, overhead projector. So the pastor had this, this much of film, transparent film, and he's putting one by one and, and moving like this. Video, the time. <laughs> These days we are using video clips and everything, right? Using computer, PowerPoint, very nice. At the time, only OHP, overhead projector, right? But from the, all the newspaper article, I came to know, wow, these stories in the Bible are real. They are real. We can verify them. We can go there. Actually, you know that in uh, 2010, people had uh, the Hong Kong people, Hong Kong and Turkey, the team, 
they announced that they, they uh, found the North Ark, they entered inside the North Ark, they videotaped it, right? During the Bible seminar, we are showing that uh, scripture, uh, the video clip, right? So in this age, in our age, there are so many evidences we can believe. This is the difference between the Bible and all other religions. The Bible, let me tell you, the Bible is from God. God gave this Bible to us. So it's from God directly. All other religions are people's invention. People made up religion to find God. And they are the made up stories. Okay, so here, verse 22, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Underline what will happen, right? What will happen means if either if you are true God, you should know the future, right? And then if you know the future, tell us. Then we can verify them. We can we know. Do you know why you know God is so confident here? Because God can do that. One example of this about the prophecy, future things, right? Israel. Israel. During the Second World War, 6 million Jews were killed out of 10 million. So 10 million were living at the time, but during the uh, Second World War by Nazis mainly, 60% of the Jewish population was killed, right? And people thought, oh, now they are dead. They'll be extinct. No hope for Jews. And the Second World War ended in 1945. But three years later, 1948, what happened? Israel became independent. Nobody expected that. And then on the day of independence, people thought, okay, maybe the nation will last only one day. Because on the very next day, the Arab countries declared war against Israel. What kind of country you are? You know, you are so small, you just started, we'll kill you all. And they started war against Israel on the very next day. What happened? The Bible says Israel will be restored. They will become a strong nation again. That's the promise of the Bible regarding Israel, right? We are living in an age that we can see all these promises coming true. That's why we can believe the Bible, right? So Israel... Uh, this year, this is the 70th anniversary. It's been 70 years since they became independent. They are still strong. No, they are surrounded by Arab countries. And Arabs, they are the fighters, by the way. You know, Arab people, they know how to fight. That's how they uh, expanded their religion. One hand, Quran, the other hand, sword. Believe or die, right? That's how they... Uh, they expanded their religion. But Israel is so strong now, right? Future things. So here, let them, verse 22, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things. Former things means what happened before. Like um, what happened before the history was written, right? God knows everything. So that and we can confirm it again and again, right? We know that the humankind started in the Mesopotamian area. That, that's what the historians say. Also, they agree with the Bible. We know that Garden of Eden, where God placed Adam and Eve, it was right there, near the uh, Persian Gulf area, Mesopotamian area. Verse 23, show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are God. Yes, do good or do evil. Do good or do evil means do something as God. Again, Israel. We know when Israel was disobeying God, they were punished by God, right? So this is also what God did. God in the Bible is God who can bless people or who can punish people. Our God is different from idols, right? So God is challenging. One time in the history of Israel, let me just share this story, very interesting story. In the time of Eliza, people worshipped Baal and Asherah. 
some idols, right? And Elijah was challenging the prophets of Baal and Asherah. So one day, Elijah said, gather all the prophets of Baal and Asherah in the Mount Carmel. Carmel. There's a Mount Carmel in Israel. So there, uh, 450 prophets of Baal came. 450. And another 400 prophets of Asherah came. Total, 850. So let's see what happened. Let's uh, go to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 19. Let's read it together. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. Who was Jezebel? She was a queen. She brought these idols actually. Okay. Israel used to worship God, but Jezebel, she was a Gentile, not a Jew, and she brought all this Baal worshiping practice and Asherah worshiping practice. And then people followed Jezebel and worshiped Baal and Asherah. So Elijah said, okay, let them come. All prophets come, okay? Why? He was challenging the prophets of Baal and Asherah. He was alone. He was alone. And there were 450 Baal worshipping prophets and 400 Asherah worshipping prophets. Let me tell you, the number doesn't matter. The number. You know, sometimes Christians are very few in number. But uh, people who are worsh, uh, believing other gods are more, it doesn't matter actually, right? What matters is, who is true God? Who is true God? So Elijah, now alone, he said, send people and to gather these, uh, let's get these, uh, all the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And this is what he said, verse 20 and 21. Let's read it together. So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. You see here, Elijah is challenging people. How long, how long will you falter between two opinions? You have two opinions. The God in the Bible is true God. That's one opinion, right? But they also worshipped Baal and Asherah. So, Elijah said, do not be in between. Make up your mind. Um, I still remember, in America, I was driving a car without knowing the direction, which way to go, right? So I arrived intersection and I didn't know where to, whether I should turn left or turn right, right? So I was like, a, uh, I, I was slowing down my car and I couldn't make a decision actually. And one car behind me, he got angry, right? And then he was passing me and they said, hey, make up your mind. <laughs> and then he just went away, right? It's very dangerous, by the way. When you drive, if you do not know whether to turn left, whether you have to turn left or turn right, it's very dangerous. Those who are following you, they can hit you, actually, right? So th that person was right. You know, I should know which way to go. So he said, hey, <laughs> make up your mind. <laughs> because I didn't know where to go. <laughs> I still remember because I was so nervous. Right? Elijah is saying, Make up your mind, Israel. You know, if God is true God, worship him. If Baal is true God, follow him. No problem. Just make up your mind. Do not, do not stand in between. No, do not have two opinions, right? And Elijah, he challenged 
people like this. Verse 22 to 24, let me read. 22. uh, Let me read. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, alone. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood. But put, put no fire under it and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood. But put no fire under it. Uh, verse 24, let's read it together. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now they are saying something, it is well spoken. Because Elijah suggests something, Elijah suggests something which you know, they understand it is quite a good way to test who is the true God. He said, get us two bulls, right? And then give one bull to the prophets of Baal and Asherah and another bull to me, right? And then let's cut the bull into pieces and let's get the firewood, firewood and put the, the, bro, uh, the cut pieces of the bull on top of the firewood. But no fire, no fire. Don't put the fire and let's pray to each one's God, right? Mm. So, if, if the fire come from the God and put the fire, the, the, the burn, all the bulls, the sacrifice, that is true God. That makes sense, right? Because if there's a true God, he should be able to do that. So what happened was the prophets of Baal and Asherah, they were praying the whole day, but, you know, no fire. So they were dancing around, no fire. And Elijah was making fun of them. Hey, pray more. Maybe your God is sleeping. Right? Wake him up. You know? <laughs> Maybe he went somewhere. Call louder. Then your God might come and then send the fire. But you know what? Nothing happened. Even they did. They hurt themselves. You know, sometimes people do that. People of the other religion, when they uh, try to worship uh, their own God, uh, they get the knife. And they cut themselves so they see the blood, thinking that God will answer their prayer when they hurt themselves. I don't believe that, you know. If there's a truly loving God, how did God ask us to hurt ourselves, actually, right? But people have that idea. We have to do some, we have to sacrifice ourselves, right? Anyway, nothing happened. And then Elijah, when he called upon the name of the Lord... Before he did that, he said, get some water, get some water, and pour the water on top of the sacrifice. Take the water. Why? If there's water, it will not burn easily. So he is making it harder and harder. But what happened was, when he called on the name of God, the fire of the Lord came down and burned all these bulls, and firewood, and even the water was dried up. People could see clearly who is the true God, right? And then Elijah said, get all the prophets of Baal and Asherah, kill them. Why? Because they are the ones who who are misleading people, misleading. You know, this matter, who the true God is, is really important, right? This is about our eternal life. We cannot, we cannot make a decision easily regarding this because it is about our eternal life. This is a very serious matter. So let's read verse 36 to 40. Let's see what happened. 36 to 40, a little bit long, but uh, let's read it together. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God, and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. 
Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked off the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. The fire came down and burned all the sacrifice and licked up all the water too. Water. You, you remember? They put the water, right? All the water was so gone, showing that the, the fire, the powerful fire came down, right? And then in verse 39, this is important. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, they said what? The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. He is true God. He only is true God. Finally they saw who is the true God. They, they said, The Lord, His God. And then they killed the prophets of Baal and Asherah all together, 850 prophets. Elijah, he showed people who the true God is. He won great victory over the prophets of Baal and Asherah. Let's remember, the fire came down. The fire came down and burned everything, showing the power of our God, right? One day, one day, we know now this earth, the world is preserved for fire judgment. Do you remember? In the time of Noah, God judged people with water. So everyone died, right? But now God would not judge the world by water again, but this world is preserved to be judged by fire, right? Whoever, any person who is against God, who is a disobeying God, or who is not listening to God, they'll be burned up. And the prophets of, prophets of Baal and Asherah, they were executed, means they were all dead. Right? We have to find the true God. That's why God gave us the Bible. Uh, from the time I was born again in 1989, I've been studying the Bible. And the more I study the Bible, the clearer it becomes to me that the Bible is the Word of God. Because there's no error. There's no contradiction. Right? How can, look at this, how can in this small book, I mean, of course, it's a big uh, compared to some other books, but it contains history, all the history, right? And then uh, the spiritual world. Spiritual world means uh, angels and the heavens and the earth, right? And this Bible contains the prophecy, the what will happen in the future, right? And this Bible tells us how to live in this world as a human because, for example, if you do not know how you can uh, conduct, how you can live in your family, with your family or in your workplace, you can read the Bible, right? You can go to the Proverbs and then Proverbs will give you all the wisdom about your life. And what about Psalm? The beautiful Psalm give you comfort, comfort and encouragement, right? This book is amazing. The Bible is everything. You know? The Bible has everything we need in our life. Um, when we read the Bible, we are comforted, right? All other books, if you read more and more, if you read one time and two times, you don't want to read again and again actually, because you know the story. But the Bible is different. The more you read, the more um, increased you are, and you want to taste the Word of God more and more. Who will, who will find God? Let's turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Verse, uh, chapter 29, um, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, Jeremiah 
chapter 29 verse 11 let's read it together for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope God says for I know the thoughts that I think toward you God has some thought about us the thoughts of peace and not of evil God wants to give us peace right the thought uh, to give you a future and a hope future only in God we have a future only in God we have a hope true hope right I found the true hope in God in the Bible that's why you know, I'm preaching the gospel to anyone whenever there's a chance right I think uh, uh, all of you also have that future and hope so this is the um, what God says verse 13 let's read it together and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart in Acts chapter 17 we learn God is not far from us actually God is very near God wants to come into our heart actually so how can he how can he receive salvation and how can he find the true God here you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. No. When we search for God, the true God, with all our heart, God will show the way. In Athens, in Athens, people didn't know the true God. That's why they made many idols and they even had unknown God. Apostle Paul said, no, I will let you know the true God, right? True God. Don't worship unknown God because in the Bible, God revealed himself, revealed, showed himself so that we can believe him. The only thing you need is you should have a searching heart. You should search for him with all your heart, right? Search, seek for him, search for him with all your heart then God will show himself to you and there are so many evidences actually that's why uh, the more we study the Bible the stronger our faith becomes and if there's anyone who does not truly believe God you have to seek more and more with your all your heart then God will God will show himself to you so that you can also have this true peace, true hope in our God, Almighty God, right? Elijah, he showed who true God is and he said, do not falter between two opinions. Always, there are only two ways. One, believing the true God. The other, following the false God, idols, right? So we have to uh, make up our mind, like the people of Israel, and we have to follow the true God. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for teaching us from the Bible how we can find the true God. We learned that you are the creator, and you are the one who gave us this Bible so that we can find you when we search for you with all our heart. Lord, there are so many false gods and many idols people invented because they are blind. They do not know the truth. But in the Bible, you revealed yourself so that we can clearly see who you are and what kind of heart you have and how much you love us. So Lord, thank you so much for teaching us and showing us the truth and Lord we want everyone in the world to come to know the truth and they come to know the true God so Lord give us more chance to preach the gospel especially we are praying for this March Bible seminar we are preparing uh, please give us chance to to invite as many foreigners as possible to this March Bible seminar so that we can 
share this good news and we can introduce the true God to all the people who are still in darkness. Lord, give us chance and wisdom and strength so that we can continue to serve you until Jesus comes again. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.